contact details is in the chat. Okay. And uh, yeah, enjoy tonight uh, or okay. today's uh, event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have now started um, our recording for the 98th week of our Indigenous Global Unity Summit events uh, that we have been doing um, here uh, through the Unity Net International uh, in partnership with Andrew Networks. Uh, but uh, this morning, as always, we do like to uh, start our events by saying a land acknowledgement. Uh, we start uh, by also always acknowledging those who came before us. So we begin today by acknowledging that we walk upon the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples. We recognize their history, spirituality, culture, and stewardship of the land. We're grateful to all Indigenous groups for their commitment to protect the land and its resources. We're committed to reconciliation, partnership, and enhanced understanding. We acknowledge the land we're meeting on here in the greater Toronto area, where I am, as the traditional territory of many nations on the land known as Tukaranto, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Wendat, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples, and is now home to many diverse peoples. We'd also like to acknowledge the land we're on here is at the meeting place of two treaties, the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and those of the First Nations of the Williams Treaty. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 and is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. We also acknowledge the Two Row Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Six Nations of the Tukaranto Watershed and the Settlers, an agreement that bound them to work together, but to develop their societies in parallel on these shared lands. It is our role as settlers and displaced people on this land to share the responsibility of challenging and disrupting colonial systems that enact violence upon the land and stand in solidarity with Indigenous peoples. We'd like to thank the Indigenous peoples of these land, including First Nations, Inuit and Métis for sharing this land with us. We also acknowledge and recognize all of the world's Indigenous peoples as stewards of Mother Earth. As such, we seek to share their consciousness and use the global momentum of these words to help unite them beyond time zones, watersheds, and jet streams, because we are all treaty people and consciousness has only a trajectory. I'll say, okay, so with that opening, um, I do like to say as well to our friends in Africa, uh, asante sana, or thank you very much uh, in Swahili. Uh, so thank you for joining us today uh, for this IGU summit event. I do also like to say sawubona, which means I see you, I see myself in you, I see your hopes, your dreams, and your struggles. I see your ancestors as well, because interconnectedness does not end with two people who are greeting each other. It extends to include the ancestors, because all beings and mother nature are interconnected. There is no sense of being separate. I see myself in all beings, and therefore, if I harm other beings or mother nature, it translates into harming myself. So today is Thursday, April 20th, 2023. It is week 98 of our IGU Summit Series. As always, I like to start with an introduction of who I am, who we are, and what we do. With the overall purpose of UnityNet being to establish a global network of community Unity Garden learning centers where hybrid exchange programs and practicum learning will be delivered by the members of Unity Net's partners in all or to all of the members of the GP4RD, our learning partnership for global unity. The learning programs are intended to be delivered through the Global Sister Schools program in partnership with the members of Global Unity Network or Unity Net. We do it uh, through twinning our local INAB collaborative communities through the CTP program of the Science for Peace Drawdown Markham Community Climate Action Hub, which has a goal of building holistic regenerative climate smart communities here in the greater Toronto bioregion in support of the UnityNet IAGBA project of localization of the global goals uh, and the establishment of a localized, productive, compassionate, collaborative, regenerative economy that leaves no one behind. So another thing I'd like to note as well is that at the end of March, Pope Francis effectively rescinded 
the papal bulls, or at least took the doctrine of discovery off the table when it comes to lawmaking in the eyes of those who follow the church's teachings anyway. Uh, so in the eyes of many indigenous people, this is a huge development. Uh, so I will be putting some information in the chat uh, for those who wish to contact me um, directly and learn about our programs. So we do have uh, some information I'm sharing about our collaborative exchange program, as well as that announcement I mentioned uh, related to the Vatican and the rescinding doctrine of discovery. There's also a related network of the practical reconciliation uh, project that we are undertaking. So uh, we'd like to build a national network of researchers and developers and educators, of course, for the globalization of the global goals with priority actions focused on regenerative development or regenerative living and lifestyles, which includes regenerative infrastructure and regenerative finance. Uh, for us here in UnityNet Canada and UnityNet Ontario, both the greater Toronto region uh, and the Ottawa Valley, uh, the city of Ottawa being the capital of our country where national decisions are made, are also going to be very important hubs of activity, especially around the delivery of local solutions for achieving sustainable energy for all, sustainable and regenerative housing, shelter, habitat for all, regenerative food for all, uh, all through these local partnership ecosystems. So helping to demonstrate and achieve essentially uh, holistic, healthy communities for all. So the specific areas of the focus for UnityNet are of course, renewable energy, sustainable agriculture, regenerative farming and food production, grown the regenerative climate smart way, along with regenerative water management and regenerative waste management or circular economy solutions for the purpose of economic growth and expansion, but specifically done the regenerative climate smart way along with integrating localized habitat solutions for regenerative holistic living, learning and lifestyle developments or redevelopments of our communities that help to achieve a globalized, productive, compassionate, collaborative, regenerative economy that leaves no one behind. Because within such development and such paradigms, it should be possible to continue to achieve economic growth at the same time as we repair our planet as we continue along this pathway of figuring out how to create a robust and resilient and equitable economic system that does not require continuous and expansion, expanding extraction and degradation of ecosystems to survive. And so we want to be both stable and sustainable and as well, of course, leave no one behind. Uh, so, oops, sorry. Um, our INAB collaboratives are really the heart of the programs we're doing. So what we do in UnityNet through our Drawdown Markham Youth Task Force mostly, uh, and done through the work of UnityNet International and our partners in UnityNet Africa and Diaspora is establish these localized INAB collaboratives, these interfaith neighborhood academic and business collaboratives that are intended to empower our local productive humanitarian entrepreneurs in each of our own local communities with the overarching goal to establish a global network of these local INAB collaboratives the humanitarian entrepreneurs who are members of these INAP collaborators, including those global partnership members, are the ones who also deliver the practical local regenerative solutions for achieving the global goals or the SDGs locally, or as we say, locally. The purpose of the INAP collaborators is not only to empower the local humanitarian entrepreneurs, but also to help organize the ongoing community engagement as well as delivering the education and training in the local solutions that are required for local people to understand how to create and run things locally in their own local communities in order to become more resilient, self-sufficient and decolonized, to better adapt to climate change, to boost their local economies, to ensure equity, and also to ensure that nobody is being left behind in their own local communities. So the INAB collaboratives also ensure transparency and accountability and are the vehicle through which we can demonstrate regenerative finance, where a portion of the monies that are spent in the community will also stay in the community, but where a portion of the productive profits from the local regenerative community enterprises are also used to help others in their own local watersheds and bioregions. This is done in order to ensure that nobody is being left behind, and where some of those funds could also be used to help others around the world. 
and to ensure that all local communities can become self-sufficient and resilient and regenerative. So our ultimate purpose being to ensure that every local community in the Unity Net Network has an INAP collaborative and a cooperative humanitarian enterprise network that is not only localizing the global goals, but it's also helping their local communities to achieve a localized, productive, compassionate, collaborative, regenerative economy that leaves no one behind. With our goal being that by 2030, it will be recognized by those who finance projects and infrastructure or provide things like insurance products, that doing a local project or infrastructure development in any local community anywhere on earth should not to get the financing until there is an active and functional INAV collaborative in that local community, made up of the community members and their allies who are also global. Uh, so my name, uh, Lloyd Halperty, I am co-founder of UnityNet International. Uh, UnityNet International, also known as UNI, is a hybrid holistic practicum learning system management company based here in Canada that also assists with community partnership building locally and globally, or as we like to say, locally, by leveraging this set of unique uh, community engagement activities developed in partnership with the members of the Ad Hoc International Advisory Board of Goodwill Ambassadors. So I am the Chief Ecosystem Director and Program Development Director, as well as a Sustainable Society Consultant uh, for what is now called Energime Institute, where I will need to actually update this slide uh, because it changed from Energime University just recently uh, to Energime Institute, which is headquartered in Manhattan. Uh, so I'm located in the city of Markham in the Don River watershed. Uh, we actually call it the German Mills Creek uh, sub watershed, which drains in Lake Ontario, which is the lowest and last in the North American Great Lakes in the Great Lakes Basin of the Greater Toronto Bioregion or GTB uh, here in Southern Ontario, Canada. Uh, we are in North America, of course, uh, Turtle Island, uh, where Energime Institute is a private 5013C nonprofit company in New York. Uh, in Manhattan, a member of the UN Global Compact, a UN uh, Academic Impact member and partner. It is a virtual institute that was created to help empower global populations to reestablish a sustainable balance with their local environments. Energime does this by designing and implementing projects that support a strong and diversified local economy while integrating core sustainable technologies and infrastructure into those communities especially in the areas of renewable energy, high density food growth solutions, and systems for sustainably managing local waste streams and protecting local water resources. We are supported by over 375 companies whose products and technologies we employ. Importantly, Energime Institute also supports local education and training in the construction, deployment, and maintenance of all the various integrated solutions for achieving these closed loop systems that in turn support self-sufficient sustainable communities. Uh, now, I'm not going to go into too much more detail today, but I am leaving my contact information in the chat uh, for anybody that might wish to contact me. There is also a link to some of our important networks, like the Energy and the Global Cooperation Turtle Island. Uh, there is also a link uh, to uh, Canada's website for advancing the 2030 Agenda at home and abroad and helping to accelerate progress on the SDGs uh, through the UN uh, decade of action. So there is also in the chat, I'm sharing a definition of the methodology of education and training for Energy University. And I'm leaving a link to the Science for Peace uh, Community Sustainability Working Group or CODSWAG as we call it, uh, which was the group that started Rada Markham, uh, which is the organization uh, that I am a chair of here uh, in this watershed here in Toronto area. Uh, there is also our link to the Climate Smart Food Program, uh, which was actually started by Science for Peace and that Community Sustainability Working Group. Uh, we do uh, peace education, uh, Science for Peace, uh, based at the University of Toronto. Now, there's our calendar. Uh, we call it our living recalendar. Uh, so I talk about events coming up. Uh, these are the most important community engagements that we do. Uh, I do like to show the audience this living recalendar. 
Uh, it is something I've been creating uh, since earlier this year. It actually is evolving almost every month as we add new things uh, and understand uh, most of the events that we'd like to do. Uh, this reflects our Drawdown Markham and UnityNet GTA plan for 2023, which now revolves around five key community engagement events in April, May, June, August, and October, with the five events, including, of course, um, this upcoming Earth Day, which we call UNDRIP Day, uh, on Saturday, April 22nd, uh, now only a couple of days away this Saturday. Uh, as an update for today, although I had earlier heard from Dr. Jose Echeverria at York University, and at that time he stated that yes, we can very likely do our Unity Net drumming ceremony during his event with the Toronto Black Farmers at, in Region Park in Toronto, instead of at Markham City Hall. Um, he wanted to work, I think, with some Indigenous peoples present, uh, but I never heard back from Dr. Echeverry, unfortunately, uh, so we'll have to catch up with him later uh, in the spring or summer. And although Jose and his team had uh, been meeting on Friday, uh, March 31st, as he said to us, to discuss and arrange it, uh, and I had sent him several text messages and voicemails and emails over the past few weeks, uh, I'm not going to chase him around, and uh, so we'll do our own. Thing. Uh, he never sent me any information about his own Earth Day event, which he said he was going to be doing on Saturday, uh, March 22nd, uh, but I'm not sure if he's actually going to be doing anything. Uh, so we'll not change our own event venue, uh, which is the Markham Civic Center Public Square uh, at the Fountain uh, at 101 Pound Center Boulevard in Markham, uh, which you can see again that information in the chat. Uh, so I, I know Dr. Echeverry, I've known him for many years. Uh, I know he's probably crazy busy, uh, but I had asked also Jose, since he is so busy, if he might be possible to have someone else from his team assigned to ours, however, uh, whoever's organizing the event in Toronto uh, to be our liaison for coordination of the events. But of course, he never got back to me with even a word, uh, even though I asked him to just reply with one word, uh, yes or no. <laughs> As a reminder, I also suggested uh, if Indigenous people were to be present at his Earth Day event uh, at Regent Park, that they will likely be the ones who should be, take a leadership role in the ceremonies, especially the drumming and smudging. Uh, hopefully we can work all this out. Uh, we can also do an event with York University at one of their climate solution parks, as they call them, at one of our next events. Uh, so what I, what I will be doing, however, is following up on this event today by trying to contact the gentleman that I had heard being interviewed on CBC radio this morning uh, by the name of Ricardo La Riviere, uh, who is a, sh a chef in Quebec who lamented that Canada is the only G20 country in the world that does not have a school food program. Uh, so what can we do about that? Uh, I'd like for people to on this call today to come together with me here in Canada through UnityNet Canada and globally through our other continental networks across the rest of Turtle Island and in Africa and Asia and Europe uh, to create a new UnityNet global food school or school food program. Uh, but starting right here in Canada by working with our partners across the spectrum from the national government to the provincial governments, to the local municipal governments, to the school boards, to the Rotary clubs and the YMCA and the Boys, Boys and Girls <laughs> clubs and all of these UN Global Compact corporations and with restaurants and restaurants associations and with farmers and food producers and food supply chain organizations and anyone else who wants to work with us. We wanna create a national food school food program here in Canada that focuses on fresh, nutritious, local, regenerative and climate smart food delivered to and by our local teachers and schools and our Thank local Thank you so very much, Roy. I certainly appreciate that. But mm -hmm. we do have our guests that have to leave shortly. Yep. So perhaps we can make a presentation now. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this, this is something I'd like to follow up with. Uh, the goal, of course, teaching young people and all of our family members and friends uh, and their local community members about these solutions that allow us to adapt and potentially thrive in a warming climate uh, and to achieve a globalized, productive, compassionate, collaborative, and regenerative economy that truly need, leaves no one behind. Um, so as we move forward, I'll let Stuart do his uh, presentation. In the meantime, I'm going to be putting some additional information about this gentleman I heard uh, this morning on CBC Radio, Ricardo Larivier.
Um, so Stuart, if you'd like to uh, move forward, uh, we'll, we'll allow you to take, do your presentation. What I'll do is stop my share right now and allow Stuart to move on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Friends, when I talk, I try to listen at the same time so that I know what every effect every word of mine has. It's easier to do that when I can see faces. I don't want people to feel obliged, but anybody who could um, make yourself visible, it would be very nice to see you while I'm speaking. And I'd like to, that said, as the spirit moves here, I'd like to begin with a verse that we begin our gatherings with around noon, around noon time. And the verse goes as follows. We must eradicate from the soul all fear and terror of what comes towards us out of the future. We must acquire serenity in all feelings and sensations about the future. We must look forward with absolute equanimity to everything that may come. And we must think only that whatever comes is given to us by a world direction full of wisdom. It is part of what we must learn in this age, namely to live out of pure trust without any security in existence, trust in the ever-present help of the spiritual worlds. Truly nothing else will do if our courage is not to fail us. Let us discipline our will. And let us seek the awakening from within ourselves every morning and every evening. Those friends are words from a friend named Rudolf Steiner, who represents the wisdom of the middle between East and West, a precious wisdom that two world wars tried staged in middle Europe to destroy, but that lives on in middle Europe, in America via my hometown in part, Concord Mass, the home of Emerson Thoreau, our Joan of Arc, Margaret Fuller, Louisa May Alcott, the Hawthorns, also that lived in the British Romanticism and the German idealism, this underground stream um, is alive and well. In terms of your work in this subject, and Lloyd, I appreciated very much your opening words, particularly your honoring of the peoples of this Turtle Island. If you have those written down and could send them to me, the first section of what you, what you spoke, I'd be very grateful to review them at more leisure. So friends, I was invited four or five years ago by a Native American friend here in the Boss Concord area to attend an important talk he was gonna give. It was a large gathering in Burlington, Massachusetts, next door to Concord. And he came up to me before he spoke. And he said, Stuart, might you offer some introductory words? <laughs> well, I said, well, let's see what happens. So I followed him to the front. I was given about 10 seconds notice and Fortunately, it was a good long walk to the front. So by the time I got there, I had a sense of what I might say. And I looked at the audience and I said, after the massacre of native peoples in Western Pennsylvania, Ben Franklin in an unusually, uncharacteristically earnest tone said, there will never be peace in this land until justice is done to the native peoples. And I took a breath and I looked at other people in the audience and I said, there will never be peace in this land until justice is done to the native peoples. And then I took another breath and I looked at others in the audience. And I said, my dear old Ma says that all good things come in threes. There will never be peace in this land until justice is done to the native peoples. And then I went, returned to my place. 
And it was a lovely presentation that my brother gave, my Native American brother gave. When I was shaving the morning before last, I realized that this is a work that I have to do at least, because if there's not peace in this land, at the cutting edge for better and for worse on our slippery slope that is in, in the United States for America, if there's not peace in this land, there's not gonna be much peace in the globe around the world. So I deepened my resolve to work towards this. I was with Bobby, Robert F. Kennedy and Dennis Kucinich, both with whom I'm working yesterday for his announcement. And he made the same point that we send billions of dollars to a war to support a war in Ukraine and on and on. You all know this as well as I. And we are impoverished here at home. The middle class is disappearing. Our children are among the sickest in the world. I think we have to go back to the beginnings. And this call I have at noon is with Michelle Shenandoah, who is the niece of a dear sister of mine, who some of you may have heard of, Joanne Shenandoah, the, the folk singer who offered up her spirit two Thanksgivings ago, a victim, I think, of the pandemic, or the pandemic, as some might say. I think Hawthorne would have called it the great bamboozlement, my neighbor Hawthorne but that's another subject. Um, Michelle and I and another friend who's the head of the Earth Day work in Concord will be talking about a Mother Earth lawsuit, colon, all entitled All Our Relations. And the premise is very simple. And that is if corporations can be granted rights as persons, which of course they're not, cannot we finally grant rights to Mother Earth, who is the source of all of our natural rights. And with rights, if they are truly right, come responsibilities as well. So we're gonna be talking about launching on Earth Day, the Mother Earth lawsuit calling all our relations. And we're working with Michelle, who's at the forefront among her people. She's of the Wolf Clan of the Oneida Nation. But there are many indigenous peoples who have been wrestling with this question. I'd like to see this as a real heartfelt coalition, at least of my red brothers and sisters and my white brothers and sisters. And of course, every other color is more than welcome, but a real fellowship of people of pale skin who are really committed to addressing this issue with our Native American brothers and sisters and all others, a real joint work together. And what we bring to the table, that is the Center for American Studies at Concord, where I'm based, is in terms of the lawsuit is what's called discovery or evidence. We live in a modern scientific age. In order to speak to that age, we have to speak to a, certain, to a certain degree in modern scientific terms. Terms I would suggest and as outlined in our village global university that are not physically science, not physical of the physical sciences, of the natural sciences, of the social sciences, or of the brain bound and reductionistic cognitive sciences, but of the spiritual sciences. So I have nothing against mysticism. I have nothing against faith and belief. They're all part of life. But they don't get us very far in terms of discovery and evidence because there has to be a shared experience. And as remarkable as our mystical experiences may be, they're, they're intensely personal. Um, so we, through our work with the Center for American Studies in the spirit of Emerson and Thoreau and Margaret Fuller and the Alcotts, we are inaugurating what I refer to as an indigenous or all American science of the spirit, a reason, faith, 
a faithful reason. Emerson said, when reason, not faith, not belief, not mysticism, but when reason is stimulated to more earnest vision, outlines and surfaces become transparent and are no longer seen. Causes and spirits are seen through them. That is, friends, when we hone and refine and focus our thinking, it can become a divining. It can become an organ of perception for things that are otherwise invisible. And that's at the heart of the science of the spirit. So our contribution to the lawsuit will be to put out a call from the Center for American Studies based in Concord, Massachusetts, but around the country and around the world, to people to present the evidence for the discovery that speaks in a, in a modern scientific, we would say spiritual scientific way, to the reality of the earth as a living being. Not just from a mystical perspective or faith or belief, which has its place, but as a, from a spiritual scientific perspective, a scientific perspective, the earth is a living being. She is the source of all of our rights, which is the basis for all of our responsibilities. And um, as such, she needs to be honored. So that's one aspect of what we're gonna be doing. Another aspect, and I'd be very interested in getting all of your responses, um, particularly the ladies, my sisters here, and that is this Saturday, the 22nd of April is Earth Day. And this is the 53rd Earth Day. 20 years, 33 years ago, a Christ cycle, and I don't mean that in any narrow denominational or religious sense of the word. 33 years ago, we held the Walden Earth Care Congress in Concord. And we had the heads of all the major environmental organizations, and industry leaders and government leaders, academics like E.O. Wilson, performers, Native American elders. It was quite an event, thanks to Henry David Thoreau and Walden Pond. Um, so we are gonna be inaugurating after Earth Day on Sunday, not just sun or solar day, because never the twain shall meet all too often between men and women um, in this age in which we find ourselves. So it's not gonna be here in Concord, Earth Day on Sunday and sun or solar, I'm sorry, Earth Day on Saturday and sun or solar day on Sunday, but on Sunday is gonna be Mother Earth and Father Sunday. In other words, we're calling upon our brothers to step up with the strength that a man has in the complementary way that a man can step forward to support our sisters, the women, Mother Earth, to bring the forces of the sun. And so we'll be inaugurating that this year Perhaps others have had the idea, I haven't heard, but if an idea is a good one, I believe it's in the air. So we'll be celebrating on Saturday here in Concord Earth Day with launching the Mother Earth Day lawsuit, all our relations. And Sunday, we will um, inaugurate the Mother Earth and Father Sunday. We will be launching the Global Intercultural Festivals that was a vision granted to a colleague in Australia. And that has to do with the center's new world drama and crown they good with sister and brotherhood, the center being the center for American studies here in Concord, um, which is across our land, many sacred sites um, from the West Coast Statue of Liberty on Mount Olympus in San Francisco to Plymouth Rock, to, the, to Kaiokia outside of St. Louis, to St. Augustine, to Santa Cruz, scenes in this new world drama related to an intercultural global festival, which can be summed up in the words of Emerson when he says, we rise to meet. 
we rise to meet. And that is that when we rise to our better selves, we can transcend all that's lower and divisive, be it religion, be it race, be it nationality and ethnic group. When my son was not quite three years old, my oldest son, Christian, he called himself Kiki. And one morning in his high chair, he didn't say Kiki wants whatever it may be, porridge or milk, whatever. He banged his fist in his high chair and he said, I am. Something awoke. When Harvard's college's lead humanist or atheist came and spoke at the first parish church in Concord, he gave a remarkable talk and I went up to him afterwards and I said, that was one of the most, with a twinkle in my eye, that was one of the most spirited talks I've ever heard. Well, he was a bit dumbfounded because he was a head of the Harvard's humanist atheist society. What's this, what's this about a spirited talk? But he did see the twinkle in my eye. So he said, what do you mean? And I had to figure out what I meant. So I paused for a moment and I recounted a dinner I had with a dear friend of mine. And she said to me, Stuart, I'm an atheist. And I paused and I reflected and I found myself saying, no, Marsha, you are a theist. I simply separated the letters. And she paused and she reflected and she said, this is a true story, friends. She said, how did you know? Well, I had to figure that out. So I paused and I found myself saying, because you began by saying, I am. You confess to something. And this young man from Harvard, Humanist Atheist Society, said, you're saying something there. I don't quite understand it. I have to think about it all night long. Well, I've kept up with him a bit on that fact. But when we talk about the intercultural festivals, we're talking about the I am. We're talking about my son Kiki and Christian's revelation that we have this higher self, the better angels of our nature. And that's what we're going to be celebrating these intercultural festivals that will also be launched on Earth Day, along with the Mother Earth lawsuit. We're also introducing a book called A Kingly Man that arose after a dear sister of mine who's of the line of the Queen of Sheba and the High Priest Malchizedek from Ethiopia. She shared with me a conversation she had with her brother, who's a sultan in Ethiopia, about the ongoing tragedy of that country. Half a million young people have been killed in war. Tremendous inflation, poverty, hunger, thirst. And um, I took it into my heart and I went to sleep with it. And I had a feeling in the morning I'd awaken to something. And I did. I woke to a story called a kingly man because her great grandfather had been a leader in Ethiopia. And when there, those trials and tribulations were going on with the people who had no salt and no food, he actually hired or commanded two ships, filled it up with food and salt and broke through the barriers and delivered it to the people, free to the people. And this is his great granddaughter. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. She's one of the few people on earth whose heart is, is under her right breast, not her left breast, who's still alive. And she's been told and agrees that it's in order to keep her thinking aligned with her heart. We will be launching this story, The Kingly Man, in the spirit of the Statue of Liberty. That is, Statue of Liberty was given as a gift to the United States, but there was no pedestal. So we couldn't put her, we couldn't put her up. We couldn't raise her up. And an industrious journalist in New York City said, well, that's no problem. I'll just go to those of means and we'll raise the money for the pedestal. Well, apparently, with all respects due, those of means weren't that interested in Lady Liberty. But he didn't give up. He was determined that we would have a Statue of Liberty erect. And so he went to the people and they contributed pennies, nickels, and dimes. They who came through Ellis Island. 
and the Statue of Liberty stands because of them. So what we're doing with this third project, A Kingly Man, is we are using it and it'd be going into schools. It's been written, I wrote the first iteration and then a colleague wrote an iteration for a younger age group. Mine is more for high school students. But the person who's illustrating it is Michael Jackson's former art teacher, who's a trustee of the Center for American Studies and, and Michael Jackson's costume designer, a blessed, blessed soul. And we're gonna be bringing it into schools. And I believe if we get one school or one 4-H club, we get behind it, then every school and every 4-H club or, or YMCA on earth will get behind it. And it calls upon the children to contribute their pennies, nickels, and dimes for the work of this great granddaughter, whose name is Huda, whose heart is in her right breast, who's opened a 13th portal from the Federal Reserve She's been adjudicating the treasury. She's a US citizen. And what we're in the process of doing is seeking to affect the shift from the great reset, which perhaps you all are familiar with, the next effort to enslave us to what we call the grand Concordian Jubilee. If the system is broken, don't fuss with it. Buckminster Fuller said, just create a better system. And that's what we're in the process of doing. Um, through this 13th portal of the Federal Reserve to raise pennies, nickels, and dimes, funds that are consecrated and that would go through this work of the great granddaughter and through our efforts with the Center for American Studies, beginning in this country, but also in Ethiopia, to addressing Franklin's words that there'll never be peace in this land until justice is done to the native peoples we need to turn to that, not exclusively, but along with Ethiopia, we'll be focusing our efforts in the reservations here. The last thing we're looking to do is um, we have colleagues, one from Holland, who um, have developed technologies, which isn't the most appropriate term, but graceful, um, systems that help water discover, recover its coherence, and that have quite remarkable healing effects on the waters. That's a longer story um, that I could go into, but I think I'll leave it at that. By my clock, I have about six minutes. I'm gonna pause there. I can come back at about quarter past, if you all are still going, I can come back about quarter past. Andrew can fill in the pieces. I just have a brief, to make a brief connection with Michelle Shenandoah, who will be with us, a lawyer and, the, and the, the niece of Joanne Shenandoah on Saturday for Earth Day. So I just need to make a connection there from about 12 to 12.15 Eastern time, in about five minutes. So I'll pause now and invite any thoughts or Lloyd, however you, you proceed. And then I'm glad to come back again about quarter past if you're still going. Okay, thank you very much, Stuart. I did um, do a little bit of writing as you were speaking, just so I would have those notes uh, available about uh, what you said. So I, I'm a very um, visual person. I like to see things written down. So um, that will be the way I remember. I actually, I probably have not told anybody this before, but actually I was also uh, a little bit uh, affected by a, an accident I had when I was a, a younger person uh, in college. Um, I do have a memory uh, problem because I was uh, hit on the noggin by a freight train oh. in a coma for a while. Um, so uh, I do have a little bit of a an issue with short-term memory. So I do tend to like to write things down so I can remember them uh, and get my, get them into my long-term memory, <laughs> which is why well, I do tend to write a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't hurt the freight train. <laughs> the, those years in college, drinking too much beer and partying too much. <laughs> that, was, that was my claim to fame when I was uh, in my 20s. 
Well, I made you host again, Lloyd. I'm going to turn it over to you. You can end today when you get ready. I have to. I'm well, to um, I think Stuart had asked uh, specifically if some of the female uh, people on our call might uh, have some words um, with regard to what he has just said. So we do have Stephanie and Lisa and Nice both on our call, and I'm, I'd like to open up to them uh, yeah, first. Yeah, before, there's no rush. I'm letting you know you can still continue, but I may have to leave, but you can continue. Go right ahead. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I just so say, Stuart did say he, he's got to get off in maybe a minute or two, right? Right, but just to say that the question in particular, Lisa and Stephanie, if the spirit moves you is, what do you make of um, Sunday, uh, Mother Earth and Father Sunday? So you'll notice actually, when I wrote in the chat, I didn't just write sun, S-U-N, I wrote sun as an S-O-N as well, right. Sunday. <laughs> Related they are. <laughs> <laughs> because you did mention that the men need, need to step up and support the women. So it's Sun Day as well. Yep. As in sons and daughters. Lisa, you were you peered for a moment. Any thoughts? Uh well, as far as things regarding celebration of women. Um, I know that statistically women do 75% of the work on this planet for about 10% of the pay. So when uh, people come up with Women's Day um, or Day of the Woman, my first thought is, well, gee, that's nice. How about every day? Because we actually do most of the work on this planet. Um, and I, I find that most systems that try to exercise equity in terms of females always have to refer to men in, in terms of um, trying to, you know, have women feel better. Uh, they, they all constantly make that comparison. And as someone who is on the spectrum, as I am, um, I find that kind of, in, in certain respects, incongruent with the whole idea. Because if our happiness uh, and our equity has to be dependent upon men deciding so, uh, somehow that seems kind of negative in, in some way. Lisa, but that, may, that's may my jump, opinion. Yeah, yeah, I'm grateful. May just jump in for clarification. Um, we're not saying anything about, really all we're saying is that we are planning this year a Mother Earth and Father Sunday. Um, no one is forced to acknowledge it. No one is forced to attend to it. We're just wanting to call upon brothers to step up and lend a hand, a heartfelt hand to the work of our sisters. That's, that's really what it's about. Yeah. And, and I believe this, this is also what our Global Unity Network is, is as well trying to uh, achieve is to um, have the men step up and uh, contribute um, to that work that's so necessary, I believe, in in this this um, transformation of our of our economy, right? It's a, um, as we as we move forward uh, into this new era. So I'd like to invite. I'm seeing as well. Uh, Stephanie is also on our call. Very much the same thing. Yeah, uh, I, I like, thank you, Stephanie Schuler, and I'm based in Toronto, Canada. Um, Stuart, I liked uh, so much of what you said and what you talked about, um, especially with uh, Maui Aloha Project, um, where I'm a, a co-founder of um, this global living, a global eco-village initiative. Um, you know, people are craving to be with the earth, you know, we're not to have experiences with the earth. We can see so much of what I do in education at the University of Toronto, OISE, um, uh, my particular dissertation topic, which I'm finishing right now, has to do basically with social and emotional well-being. And so much of what you talked about is about trauma and the lack of social and emotional well-being that 
We have systemically for generations on Turtle Island and around the world, you know, and this restart, you know, this restart that we feel is upon us, COVID, uh, you know, planned or not has given us the opportunity to look at the very dark, the darkness in our society. Um, and through darkness, that's, that's where light emits as well. That's where we see the, the light begin. And I believe that Unity Net International and all the people you know, on this call and associated with what we're doing is to emit that light. We're at a time where uh, uh, we must look to the cycles of the sun and the moon and the cycles of the earth and the rhythms, and we must get in tune with them all better, which is part of what we're trying to do to garner the old wisdoms and even merge them with the new the new ways that are responsible for the planet and all of its inhabitants um so uh you know um and as far you know we we say mother earth and and we're taught you mentioned you know father son um you know these are terms uh that we've used and you know we're in a changing time where we aren't supposed to only delineate based on gender. Um, and perhaps um, there would be some offense to saying mother earth and father son, I don't know. But for me, basically what we're, what we're saying there is we're calling in, as you said, all of our relations, all of our relations, all of the people, all of the colors, all of the cultures, all of our identities, um, without, you know, um, with looking to our strengths rather than, you know, our weaknesses where we've been labeled in society. And to look to our strengths and put that all together and say, what do we have to go do to go forth now in this era, in this era of change and opportunity? And that's what we're trying to do at Unity Net Internet with Unity Net International and with the planet, with planet Earth. How do we get more aligned with the rhythms and the ways that we need to um, reconvene for our survival and beyond? So thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, I'm also seeing uh, Malaika. Uh, so Malaika is coming to us from uh, Uganda in Africa. And uh, so I'm hoping very much that Malaika will be able to, uh, if not, she may not have watched uh, some of the earlier, I'm not sure if she was watching some of the earlier um, presentations um, on Facebook, because uh, we are live streaming. Uh, but Malaika, maybe you could at least uh, introduce yourself so Stuart knows who you are, um, if that's possible at all. If not, uh, oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Professor, and thank you for everyone who has logged in. It is always my pleasure to be part of this meeting, Thursday meetings, because I've really gained a lot as an individual, as a leader as a team member, and also as a, as a person and as a country. Thank you so much for the organizers. And I also appreciate uh, Pastor Patrick for the consistency for the IGU Summit meetings. My name's Amalaika Gabriela Ligami. I'm from Uganda, Kampala. I'm the executive director of an age care organization it's an organization that advocates and supports the elderly persons. Those are the seniors, 60 years and above, and the orphan vulnerable children under their care, aspiring to a society where all these older persons and the youth and the orphan children under their care have opportunity to live fulfilled lives. I'm also part of the Unity Net Africa and Diaspora team. I'm among the first people or the first uh, members that initiated the supported Professor Lloyd on this vision. And at Unity Net Africa and Diaspora, I serve as the, the continental treasurer 
And by faith, I believe it will stand because we are pushing for this to be reality, in reality. Because for the past two years, we've been just talking and talking, but we had our first, we are going to have our first board meeting. We had it already and we believe things are turning out for our better. So I just want to add, Professor, that no, don't give up on UNAD. Don't give up on Africa. Don't give up on us. Uh, at least for us who are there, we are following. We are supporting. We are here to serve. We are here to make our communities better, only for the glory of the Lord that we are serving anyway. And lastly, Uganda, to access Facebook since the last elections, uh, they put a, a note on uh, Facebook. Not everyone accesses Facebook. You have to get PIN, you have to get logs. So many people will rarely get to Facebook, but uh, that's why I've not been getting those videos, but I just follow up what you sent on the, on the page. So YouTube can do for me and other platforms, but for Facebook, it's really, it's really hectic for some of us to get there. So we are just waiting for the president to unlock that and make Facebook to be free for everyone in the country. That's how hectic sometimes it can be in Africa. But in all we are here, our discussions are not in vain. One day we shall have the liberty and one day we shall look back and really see our efforts that we've been planting and sowing in like such a time to be fruitful. Otherwise, greetings to everyone. I'm so happy to see Madam Sheila. Uh, we look all great. Happy New Year's, everyone. And thank you so much. I'm in the backyard following the meeting closely till the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malaika. So, uh, Stuart, I'm hoping you are, I see you're still here. You are still listening, I hope. Um, so yes, uh, Gabriela, um, Malaika and Uganda. What I also wanted to mention as well is that uh, part of the campaign as we move forward, uh, we are hoping to work with a gentleman um, in Northern Kenya. He is uh, an indigenous man. Um, of one of the tribes uh, in Northern Kenya is actually on the border with Ethiopia. Um, and so there could be a connection that we could make, especially as we approach uh, the Markham Arts Council and to move forward to uh, develop, especially uh, as I mentioned this morning, this education program, um, the school food program uh, that uh, this gentleman uh, would like to establish here in Canada. So there is a negotiation right now. Uh, this is very timely. I just heard it this morning uh, in the interview on uh, the radio. Uh, so we will uh, see how we can align ourselves uh, to help uplift and to ensure that these programs are successful wherever we are with, of course, our idea being that uh, whatever we might develop uh, here in Canada, uh, could potentially also be applied in uh, other local communities worldwide, uh, which is the uh, overall concept uh, where we're using what we call uh, open source regenerative climate smart infrastructure uh, as the basis for establishing what we call Unity Garden learning centers in our communities, uh, which really consists of gardens and forests and uh, farms and kitchens uh, and uh, some open source hardware solutions that we have been promoting uh, for the past couple of years. Uh, so uh, with this, we can either um, move forward, I can continue with my presentation or if anybody would like to uh, speak um, on any more of the, what has been talked about today, uh, I'm seeing it's actually 12.10, so it's actually only one hour uh, that we've been on the call today. Um, so um, maybe a little bit of a vote, uh, what people would like to me to do. Uh, move forward with, and continue my presentation, the normal presentation to remind everybody of the upcoming events. Uh, we do have, of course, Earth Day in two days, uh, World Biodiversity Day coming up on Sunday, May 22nd. Uh, International Youth Day, um, 
uh, in our Abraham project on June 5th on World Environment Day, uh, International, Youth, International Youth Day, Saturday, August 12th, our Global Coordinated Bubble Fund Festivals, uh, that uh, Unity Net Community Unity Weeks, um, and then of course in October, Youth Peace Weeks between Global Cooperation Day and World Food Day. Uh, so um, what do people think? Anybody still on the line that uh, would like to uh, continue watching our regular presentation or should we wrap up or wait until Stuart comes back? Stephanie, are you still there? Well, yeah, I think, I think, I mean, Stuart said he was coming back. He just had to take that quick call. So I, yeah. maybe continue yeah. till he comes back with the regular presentation. Okay, okay, I'll do that then. Yeah. Until and then somebody can mention when when Stuart comes back. Sure. Uh, and then I can just stop. Okay. Let me share one more time. Um, so th as I mentioned, um, we do have the yearly calendar here. Uh, World Biodiversity Day, Sunday, May twenty second. Uh, we haven't done it before, and it's not yet published. Um, but that's this uh, bright green day here in the middle of the calendar. Uh, then we have our Abraham Project tree planting on Monday, June 5th, World Environment Day. This is the big bright red one here. And uh, International Youth Day, Saturday, August 12th, uh, down a little bit further down in the middle here, where we do the globally coordinated uh, bubble fun festivals uh, during Unity Net uh, Community Unity Weeks. And then there's uh, the October events, the Youth Peace Weeks, um, again, between October uh, Global Cooperation Day October 4th, um, our Ubuntu Summit, which we've done for the past, I believe, three years, uh, online virtual event, uh, launching the Youth Peace Weeks, uh, and then our Global Fund and Smart Youth Forum, uh, the hybrid event uh, that we'd like to take place on uh, Monday, October 16th, uh, down near uh, the bottom of our calendar on World Food Day. And then you'll see uh, these weeks uh, on every Sunday. Uh, so those are Somos Avalon Maya, the spiritual events that take place with the Maya in Playa del Carmen, Mexico, every Sunday at 11, 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. And this might be uh, something where we can align with what Stuart's doing on the, um, uh, the Sun's Day, the Fathers and Sons Day um, at 11, 11 uh, a.m. Uh, with these uh, existing events that are taking place every Sunday. Uh, so we can now potentially um, celebrate our mothers and fathers and families uh, every Sunday, uh, every week throughout the year. So as Lisa and Issa said, uh, we need to celebrate the women uh, and their amazing work uh, in healing our planet, uh, not just one day a year or even one month a year, but uh, every, every week of the year. Of the year. Um, so again, um, just being a coincidence that they're showing in pink on the calendar. Uh, Mitch Gold was the one who's uh, brought those to our attention earlier um, this year. Uh, he said, uh, specifically, we are looking at how to connect the two energies of the eagle and the condor uh, with us here in the north being represented by the eagle and those in the south uh, being represented by the condor. And you'll see that, of course, in our logo for the Global Unity Network uh, with the eagle and the condor representing the North and the South or the uh, developed world and the developing world. Uh, so uh, I do wanna mention as well, uh, Tuesday, January 17th, right at the beginning of our calendar, um, we had our first Strata and Markham virtual event. Uh, that's actually when we had Lisa and Issa on with us. Um, we did discuss establishing PodNet GTA as well as an enterprise network to support the 25 INAP collaboratives that we are, are hoping to create here in the greater Toronto area uh, over the next uh, few years. Uh, so in the past few weeks, I mentioned that Markham and the greater Toronto area will be doing everything through these INAP collaboratives, including demonstrating regenerative gardens, forests, farms, buildings, kitchens, and finance. Uh, so, uh, of course, we'll be empowering our humanitarian entrepreneurs, uh, the ones who are localizing the global goals in each of our own local communities. So I do invite everybody to join us wherever you are in the world. Uh, this is the essence of our global unity network. Uh, what 
multicultural network of networks consisting of these local and localized multi-stakeholder partnerships uh, that are the interfaith neighborhood academic and business collaboratives, those uh, eight sector partnerships where uh, we are hoping moving forward to change the paradigm of development globally, uh, essentially doing it one local community at a time. So I mentioned for the past few weeks as well, uh, the other things to consider are the FAO's um, announcement of 2023 as the International Year of Millets. Uh, so we do also have COP15, uh, which happened, uh, this Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, uh, important also because it established a set of global biodiversity goals, uh, which are new, uh, but this came from this past December from that meeting that took place in Montreal. The new set of goals are the things we are also supporting in addition to those sustainable development goals or the SDGs, uh, the global goals. Uh, so the global biodiversity goals need to be translated into national goals in every country, uh, considering each country's circumstances and priorities. Uh, so I will be putting some details of that as well into the chat so people can save that. Uh, information. Um, there's also the 2023 SDG summit uh, coming up, this high level political forum on sustainable development uh, that will be held under the auspices of the General Assembly. Uh, so that is uh, 19th and 20th of September. You can see that in their calendar as well. Uh, so this General Assembly high level week uh, is where the heads of state and governments come together, gather at the UN headquarters in New York in Manhattan follow up, review the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and those 17 SDGs. Uh, so this is added to the calendar. Uh, and as I said before, I'm hopeful that we'll be present at that event, uh, possibly in collaboration with our partners in Manhattan, uh, specifically uh, with Energy Institute, as it's now called, uh, as well as We the World. Uh, so Rick Ulfik and Bill Sosinski. Uh, so again, as I noted, uh, 2023 SDG Summit. Uh, you'll see that information um, in the chat. Uh, there's also some information about, about um, was published by the FAO, uh, their newsletter from earlier this year. Uh, so we will want to align ourselves uh, with what the FAO is doing as well. Um, in the recent meetings that were also had between um, our officials in Ottawa and Washington, D.C. And so I'm hoping that uh, Canada and the U.S., as well as Mexico uh, and the Caribbean and all the rest of the Blue Island communities uh, will be able to participate uh, in helping to move this entire agenda forward um, around all of our communities uh, worldwide uh, as we take a new leadership role uh, and call together all the people including all the indigenous people uh, and as they say, the warriors of the rainbow um, and all the cultures around the world. So there is also the uh, biodiversity uh, network that we had created. Uh, that is important for us to move forward as we promote those new set of goals. Uh, and then we have the regenerative living, learning and lifestyle network, which I've called uh, one of our top level networks in the network of networks. So as we move forward with our legacy projects here in Markham, uh, we're already begun uh, having those conversations with people like the Seven Generation Initiative. Um, so Dr. Jose Echeverry was one of them, but uh, right now our interaction with the Seven Generation Initiative, um, although it is with Dr. Echeverry, is, who is the leader of Seven Gen Markham and the GTB team, um, we continue our work with the Seven Gen Initiative here in Markham through uh, Brian Papa. Uh, so we'll come back to working with Dr. Echeverry and his climate solution parks uh, that are spearheaded uh, by IREA at York University here in Markham. Uh, but we also hope again to meet with founders, Brian Papa and Susan Bozak as well. Uh, so we soon hope to have conversations with Charles Hopkins, uh, the UNESCO Chair in Reorienting Education Towards Sustainability who's also at York University in Markham, uh, because we learned uh, last March, about a month ago, during our Drawdown Markham Zoom meeting, 
uh, Leslie Adams said, uh, biodiversity and sustainable development goals um, that she's campaigning on, via, on behalf of Sierra Club Canada Foundation. Uh, she said it's UNESCO that's actually doing the work of the goal of the SDGs ahead of 2030. Uh, she did note that the UNDP development program already has a lot of net in that uh, framework already. Uh, this can be the things that are taught to young people through the proposed global unity uh, and unity at school food programs, starting with these national school food programs here in Canada. Uh, so this is, as noted before, where we also hope to have a conversation with the founders and leaders of the Maple Leaf Center for Action on Food Security. Uh, because 2021, uh, last year, Maple Leaf, or actually it was two years ago, Maple Leaf Foods claimed to be the first major carbon neutral company in the world um, or food company in the world. So they have ambition, ambitious science-based targets to reduce their carbon emissions even further. Uh, specifically, Maple Leaf Foods has already started their investments in regenerative agriculture, uh, representing a significant industry milestone, on the quote unquote, in their own words. Uh, so today I do include in the chat a link to a YouTube video by Michael McCain the president and CEO of Maple Leaf Foods, uh, stating their commitment to become what he calls the most sustainable protein company on earth. Uh, so uh, you'll find in the chat uh, information about the Seventh Generation Initiative, um, the Seventh Generation Project, uh, as well as being led by Dr. Jose Echeverry uh, here in Markham, who's with um, Prada and Markham's uh, EQB Project. Uh, and is also, of course, uh, with York University Markham. Uh, so you'll find the chat as well, connection to UNESCO chair in reorienting education towards sustainability, which is again housed at York University uh, Markham's new uh, uh, campus, which is slated to be open next year. Uh, it's now under construction. Uh, so we are aligning ourselves as best we can. Uh, with the, the programs that will be delivered through the York University Markham campus, which is in our backyard uh, here in uh, where I am, uh, just down the road, a couple of kilometers or miles, I guess some people would know who are in the US, uh, but it's uh, fairly close to us. We also have Seneca College uh, just down the road as well. Uh, so I'm just um, putting some uh, very important links in the chat for all of these organizations that I just talked about, um, including the programs of Maple Leaf Foods uh, and their investment in regenerative agriculture and uh, carbon offset, which are not my favorite thing, but um, that's what they're moving forward with. Uh, we'll try to align our programs to what they'd like to do. Uh, so. A second and perhaps more important event, and I mentioned it very briefly early, earlier, um, uh, I went to, uh, in the last few weeks, um, I attended an event last Wednesday, uh, April 12th, here in Markham, hosted by the Markham Arts Council and the Markham Talent, as they call themselves. Well, we, they had a press work conference to announce the second time for the 2023 open casting call, the first ever talent hunt for performing art, artists in Markham where the announcement last week was a departure from their previous calls because they expanded their call for artists from all across Ontario instead of just here in Markham. So they're, in their words, performing artists will not be bound by geographical boundaries and auditions from all cities in Ontario are being accepted. Of course, it's not yet a call for artists outside of Canada or even outside of Ontario. Uh, not yet, uh, but maybe next year. And so I, they want to identify performing artists, including singers, dancers, actors, models, magicians, etc., who will get an opportunity to showcase their talent to an exemplary judging panel that includes Juno Award board member Adria, Adria, Adiri O'Brien, casting director Banan Levy, producer and eye dance choreographer and casting director of The Next Step, Amy Wright, singer-songwriter, uh, I Juno Awards nominee Robert Laidlaw, talent manager Patricia Jarose, model tip agent and eye manager Cynthia Culley, the Dean of York University's School of Arts, Media Production and Design, Dr. Sarah Bei Cheng, 
actress Samantha O'Quinn, actor Lucas Nguyen, Chalet studio owner David Chest, and perhaps most importantly, Toronto's top runway coach, Jessica Gregory, which also uh, has many prizes and cash prizes for winners. Uh, but uh, last week, I did have a good conversation uh, with the personal assistant, Amanda Young Colucci, who is Ward 6 counselor here in Marco, who organized the event that took place last week. And she also introduced me to Amanda, who I explained to her what we're doing. So counselor Colucci indicated that she would really like to follow up with more discussions after May 1st. So I talked to many other people about our UnityNet Community Unity Garden Learning Center network concept and the fact that we'd like to approach the development of these centers through engagement with local and global artists and through community to community partnerships. And I was floored by the almost overwhelmingly positive response I received. And I hope to follow up with at least one other person I had talked to. And that is Toronto's top runway coach, Jessica Gregory, who is of course a model, but she's also a modeling coach, especially for young people and those who are new to modeling, acting and performance. In particular, I'd like to invite Jessica to have a conversation with Janice De Silva in Cabo Verde about her One Dress, One Smile initiative to promote cultural exchange and global solidarity through fashion. So I will invite her and her colleagues to join and promote the UnityNet Fashion Cultural Exchange Network, which was originally created uh, with Janice, uh, one of our IAIBA Goodwill Ambassadors, who's also promoting their adoption, uh, the adoption of this open source regenerative climate smart infrastructure and the humanitarian enterprise solutions through her connections with UN Habitat. Uh, so I will be sending out an email, an introduction to Toronto's top runway coach, Jessica Gregory, as a follow-up to our discussion last week. And I'll copy Amanda young Colucci, a uh, Ward 6 counselor here in Markham, who organized last week's event in the city of Markham's a first ever talent hunt for performing artists across Ontario. Uh, so we can have a discussion about establishing the very first UnityNet Community Unity Garden Learning Center and Unity Hub and UnityNet's Peace Center right here in Markham by establishing a Markham INAP collaborative and partnering with local corporations and SMEs in Markham, along with whatever companies or organizations, NGOs and CBOs or otherwise, that would like to establish Canadian offices here to assist in this process of partnering with other local INAP collaboratives globally. So we can, all of us, begin to long process of globalizing these global goals and achieving a globalized, productive, compassionate, collaborative, regenerative economy that leaves no one behind. Uh, so this is uh, the actions I'll be taking this week, um, following up especially with uh, this uh, artist uh, at the Markham Arts Council Council and their supporters in the city of Markham. Uh, so you'll see a little bit of information there. Um, so I'm seeing that Stuart is back. Uh, if Stuart would like to also continue uh, in the discussions about his own events and how we can align with them, because uh, this is really what we are trying to do uh, as we move forward with our UnityNet um, programs is essentially to support whoever is moving ahead with their own programs, provided uh, the outcomes are um, what we would like to achieve, of course. Thank you. I, Stephanie, I appreciated your words as I did of Lisa, if she's still here. I had to leave um, maybe two thirds of the way through if it wouldn't be asking too much, if you could just reiterate the last part, and I'm sorry, but I didn't want to keep the others waiting. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, so basically what I did was I went through- I'm I sorry, I was the, addressing Stephanie Lloyd there. Oh, right, okay. Sorry. Yeah, well, I, I very, very much speak the same language as you do. And this, you know, they say is the time of the, you know, the eighth prophecy, the eighth fire, uh, where we all come together uh, around the world. Um, and that's what our hope with Unity International is, is that this can really be a time um, 
of reconciliation, of reparation, I see with your lawsuit um, how crucial that is uh, with the lawsuit that's going on. Um, and I know that from my endeavors um, that really, especially at the University of Toronto, where I'm completing my doctorate in education, which basically looks at the social emotional or the holistic implications of being labeled in a system, which are all constructs that we have created in our recent history and how we divide, we continuously divide. Um, and you talk about ego and we know, you know, competition, you know, these are all things that have existed. And even the schoolhouse perhaps is an old paradigm because uh, as I continue to talk to parents and teachers and school people about the well-being of children and of course we know not only do we have a youth mental health crisis in the world but we have a mental health crisis in the world these are all a reflection of the state of the planet you know physically and socially um so to to this is a time to uh, where we where there is um in um unlimited potential you know we're having space tourism in the world we have such wealth in the world through um a reordering of things we live in a time where we can uplift all in the world and all should be able to have enough and beyond this can be heaven on earth but we're facing that crisis and at a time where there's such darkness politically in the world, COVID such darkness, um, however it came upon the world, but from the darkness is the light. And I believe that um, Unity Net International, I believe Maui Aloha Project and so many of the grassroots peoples and organizations that we're trying to gather right now are the light. It's a time to um, shed light on new systems and to you know this they say this is a feminine era um where basically we are bringing together the empathy side the uh caring and nurturing side of for the planet for the physical planet and for all of its inhabitants and you talked about um yeah, Mother Earth and Father Son, you know, bring together the entire community, uh, the communities that have recently not been caring as much about other people, only the ego side, and bringing consciousness together in the communities, um, the individuals, the corporate side, the grassroots sides, bringing that all together. I think we're in a time I believe we're in a time of great change, of shift, and um, and that I know that that's what, how I spend my time, trying to be hopeful and trying to be a part of um, co-creating a new earth, and um, uh, and hopefully affecting change, especially for all the groups that have been for decades now um, labeled and differentiated and separated and um, um, hopefully to bring about a time of oneness. And, and I, I'm familiar with, you know, many of the philosophers that you're referring to and Rudolf Steiner, of course. And um, I look all over the world at different paradigms, alternative education spaces and alternative living communities. And um, I can see we're upon a shift, whether um, a shift because it's needed, uh, housing security, food security, and social well-being security. You know, the, you know, Canada has one of the top uh, one of the top five highest youth suicide rates in the world. A developed world with so much, um, and that's general population statistics, not just one group. So. Um, um, I'm grateful for your care about um, humanity and the planet, planet Earth, Mother Earth, and um, I look forward to hearing more, more about what you have to say. Stephanie, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And friends, I didn't mean to, to exclude my brothers in terms of inviting any responses. I did want to get, I'm, I'm 
interest in the reactions from sisters with the idea of Saturday 22nd, Earth Day as always, Sunday instead of just Sunday or Solar Day, you know, never the twain shall meet, whether by us inviting the Earth Day into Sunday along with Sun or Solar Day, how people felt about that, beginning with our sisters, but I'd also be interested, Hendrik and anybody else, Lloyd and anybody else, to your, your thoughts on what I attempted to share. And Malika, I don't know if I know. Be nice to see you. Malika, are you there? Can one see your face by chance? Oh, yeah. it, it may be that Malika, uh, who's in Uganda, who did introduce her earlier herself, um, I'm not sure if you were able to hear her, her introduction or not. I'm afraid I didn't. OK. Um, also, we're, I'm, I'm seeing uh, Doris is coming on our, the line now. Uh, so Doris is also in Africa as well. Um, but I would like to actually, before I get to Henrik, I'm just seeing it, he's coming on as well. Um, if Malaika could introduce herself one more time uh, so Stuart can know who you are. Thank you. Well, I guess, that, is, it, is it possible for you to uh, introduce yourself one more time? Just so Stuart, uh, is, who had not heard your previous introduction. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Is it possible you could turn on your video this time? Okay. I'm guessing it's dark over there. Yeah, it's very dark where I am. Uh -huh. I think next time better, yes. It's very dark. Uh -huh. uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be part of this meeting. The IGU Summit Thursday meetings, they have been a blessing to me. Um, and I'm grateful to always be able to log in. My name's uh, Malaika Gabriela Ligami. I'm from Uganda, Kampala City, and I'm privileged to be an executive director for an NGO, an aged care organization called JAFOA. This organization advocates and supports the elderly persons. This is 60 years and above, uh, both male and female and the orphan vulnerable children under their care. And I'm grateful to be part of the people who love the seniors. And apart from that, I am also a member of Unity Net Africa and Diaspora, UNAD, the visionaire being our Professor Lloyd. Uh, Professor, thank you so much for bringing this initiative that brought us together as Africans, one, one together. And another thing I wanted to share about my introduction was I was among the key people who started or who initiated the Unity Net Africa and Diaspora in Africa. And at the, at the board, I serve as the treasurer, continental treasurer at Unity Net Africa and Diaspora, that's UNAD. And we are so grateful. We are hopeful. We are not going to fail the visionaire. That's Professor Lloyd. And we've been, the past two years, it has been a talking. We've been just talking, meetings and talking, but we believe we have now gotten to a time whereby we have to put what we've been talking into action. And we believe this will bring Africans together. We shall have better communities that we serve, and we shall really see a change in what we started two years back. In brief, that's my introduction. I'm humbled to be part of this meeting all the way from Africa, Uganda. Next time I'll put on my video. It's really dark here, but I'm thankful, Professor. Thank you so much for the opportunity because it has always been a plus for me to be part of these meetings. I have gained. I'm a better leader. I'm a better team member. I'm a better executive director and hoping to be the best ever to change 
what Africa is and what Uganda is and what our communities are. Thank you so much, Professor. Malika, oh, it's you. beautiful to hear the angels, J angels singing with you when you were talking. And um, I spent a year traveling around the world singing a song from your country, Uganda, which I'll share with oh. you. I'll share with you another time. <laughs> okay, sir. Wow. Actually, Malika means angel in English, but I prefer being called African way, Malika. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and there's also another connection that Malaika has um, to Canada. Uh, apparently her brother uh, is in Vancouver. Um, so Malaika is actually a, uh, we have a, what we call regional networks around across Canada. We have, uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, the importance of Ottawa. So we have what we call UnityNet Gov which is a play on words uh, because obviously the Canadian government is in Ottawa. Uh, so unity net gov means greater Ottawa Valley, uh, GOV. Um, and so we have greater Toronto area. We have greater Ottawa Valley. We have greater uh, Calgary area, GCA. And we also have greater Vancouver area. G, um, uh, the greater Vancouver area is actually where her Malika's brother is living. Uh, so Malaika is actually a member of that network as well. Uh, so we have that, uh, that relationship there uh, where we're trying to leverage the people in our network as well to help us move forward in our local community, each one of our local communities. Uh, and this is the, the concept that we're doing is uh, from the grassroots, um, spreading, spreading our message uh, among those who live in these communities. I'd like to as well, if that's possible. Uh, did I see one more person come on the call earlier? Oh, we seem to have a little bit of writing. Yes, around. please. Hello. Oh, Michael. Yes, oh, Michael. Right. Yes, I thought I saw somebody else come on the call. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to me. I'm Kakule Mubuzapu Michael, the founder and the chief executive office at a Group Academia. RDC, a youth-led organization working to support and to empower young people through beekeeping and agribusiness apart from vocation training. And uh, uh, it's just a pleasure to join you through this uh, wonderful network. As I still knew, I'll have to get more information more about the network, maybe the way we're gonna be doing. But uh, uh, about myself, I'm a beekeeper from 11 years uh, and up to now I'm just running beekeeping. I'm 32 years old. I learned this from my father who is a beekeeper from 74 up to now. So beekeeping is my passion. passion. Beekeeping is my life and let us protect the pollinators everywhere for our living and living of the planet. Beautiful. I'm sorry, what country are you from, Michael? I'm from, I'm from DR Congo, Democratic okay. Republic of Congo. Good. I was speaking the other day with Michel Lumumba, the, uh, yeah, yeah. the son of your former prime minister, who's a friend here and a neighbor here in Massachusetts. Um, also, if you ever need any connections with beekeeping, um, Gunter Hauk, H A U K, has done wonderful work in bringing back the bees. If you ever, if, if you don't know the name, but if you want to, um, my my contact information is in the chat. I'd be glad to put you in touch with Gunter Hauk, H A U K. He's created sanctuaries for bees and done remarkable work. Wow, wonderful. Really, it's a pleasure and to meet you. And I have to let you know that I'm organizing the celebration of the World Bee Day in my region. And uh, we are working on this seriously. Hopefully, we're going to share what is going to be coming up so that uh, green entrepreneurship has to be just uh, boosted by, by this uh, initiative as, uh, as soon as possible. We are just involved. So I'd like to ask Michael, um, 
also that we follow up as well. I would like to invite you. We have uh, something called uh, the Honey Project, uh, wow. the Unity Net Honey Project. Uh, we discussed it actually with Malaika and some of the some of the people in South Africa specifically as well. Um, and so the the concept of the Honey Project is to actually transform degraded lands. And we were looking specifically looking at former mine, former mines and former mining lands and transform them into uh, flower gardens or um, meadows. And then those meadows would then grow flowers that could be used by bees and the beekeepers to produce the honey. But what we wanna do is create what we call climate smart landscapes. So landscapes that are actually sequestering carbon uh, as we restore these degraded lands back into productivity. So the first step being to plant uh, flower meadows, uh, meadows full of flowers on these degraded lands uh, that could then be used by the pollinators, the bees, to produce what we then now call climate smart honey. And so the bee or the honey project was that attempt at, at uh, engaging, especially those big corporations um, the mining companies, uh, many of whom are UN Global Compact members, uh, in helping to us to move this agenda forward so that they can restore the lands they are destroying through their mining projects. So we can begin that process of restoring nature back onto these degraded lands. But we start by planting flower, flower meadows, uh, meadows of flowers to help the, the bees um, and produce something from these lands that would otherwise not be able to produce anything at all. Uh, so as a first step before we eventually turn them back into forests over many decades. Um, but uh, the, the idea is that uh, yes, we can do mining. Yes, we can do extraction from these lands. And yes, we understand that through this process of extraction, we will likely destroy uh, many parts uh, of the world and the biodiversity that used to be there, but it is possible to restore these lands. Uh, but we need to start uh, with something that's the starting point can be to restore the lands um, in a way that's climate smart and, and restore the lands uh, so that we can also help bees, so that we can also produce, hopefully, so hopefully produce some income from the production of the, this uh, climate smart honey. And so this is a project that we wanted to get going in, in specifically in South Africa and Uganda uh, and in DRC as well, uh, where there are so many wow. mines, right? So if we can look at the mining that's happening there, work with those mining companies, work with the governments, work with the grassroots organizations in those communities and say, look, your, your mining is destroying the landscape, but it's possible if we work together to restore these landscapes. Let's start by planting wildflowers on those lands because they won't support very much more. Of course, they won't support traditional farming anymore because these are completely degraded landscapes, many of them contaminated. But I'm sure there are solutions out there that the scientists have discovered where we can trap those pollutants and make sure they don't get into our food supply chains. And by growing those flowers on those landscapes, harvesting the honey from those flowers, we can actually, di we can actually diagnose whether those uh, contaminants that are on those lands are going down over time because we can an analyze the honey that the bees are collecting. So now there's a way that we can, we can understand for ourselves in, in numbers, are we actually restoring these lands back into productivity and back, into, into the, back to nature? Because this is what we need to be doing everywhere around the world, of course, especially as we uh, enter the, we are part of this um, UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration. And this was the, the, the process, the Honey Pro Project was all about how do we restore nature uh, during this UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration and beyond, of course, because uh, the decade is only until 2030. Wow, wonderful. Really, it's going to be my pleasure to join those different opportunities. 
as soon as possible. As the last time I've been just held a little presentation at a park, African Protect Area Congress, where I shared uh, how a, a new approach, which we could try to see how we can adopt uh, in a beekeeping domain. Because most of the projects which are running here and there are just not taking um, some aspect either to protect pollinators around the cities. In the towns, there are more colonies who are killed, although there are no ambassadors who could protect those colonies to the specific places, which it can facilitate people to get more opportunities as an entrepreneurship through this beekeeping. The second, we would like to see how we can um, we, we can uh, we can uh, we can engage in uh, capacity building uh, with some beekeepers who are on the ground so that they may be uh, uh, be working with the standard norms. Apart from that, we needed to get a, a network of of just uh, the honey product market so that we could try to exchange what we are having as product, such as in the Congo, we do have honey which is from coffee and those cacao and even a more, more, more really uh, plants due the biodiversity, which mm -hmm. frozen. Unfortunately, Michael, you, I don't know if you can hear us, but you are frozen at this point. Uh, so this, this is typical, uh, it happens uh, quite frequently uh, that, um, the connection, of course, uh, to our uh, colleagues in Africa can sometimes be a little bit shaky, uh, which is actually part of the reason that we want to establish these, uh, what we call Unity Garden uh, Learning Centers uh, with uh, high-speed uh, off-grid uh, renewable energy powered uh, internet access for many communities that may not have it. Oh, uh, would you get me the humbug? Can I have a word? What are you asking for? Oh, frozen again, I believe. So Michael, it seems, is coming in and out. In and out. Uh, did anybody hear what he had just asked for? I didn't hear what that was. It sounded like a board, but I'm not sure. I think he said he was he was back, like he could hear you now, but then it went out again. I thought he, I thought I heard him ask for something. Could, yes, could you share the? And then he said board. Uh, or something. Not sure. Okay. Um, so we seem to have lost Michael at this point. Uh, I. Do we want to uh, have me continue or do we want to continue just having a conversation around the oh. themes? Ah, Michael, thank you. I <laughs> really, we, we had a, a technical issue with my network, but mm -hmm. yeah, the pleasure is mine to have you really through this network. It was very wonderful. And I will have maybe more time to share our experiences. I've been saying really, it's have been our life and our passion. We'll have to share what we have in this beekeeping domain and uh, to learn from others as well as possible. So really, I'm very delighted to be joining you and uh, hopefully I'll have to get those numbers as we have promised so that we may develop later after the session. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and we, can, we can look at other biodiversity uh, actions that can be taken, especially in cities like here in Canada, for instance, the David Suzuki Foundation um, not just supporting the bees, but also supporting the butterflies as well. Uh, so looking specifically at what butterflies need in terms of their own food sources, their own habitats, um, looking at all of these pollinators in particular and saying, what can we plant in our own gardens, in our own, at our own houses, on our, on our streets, um, in, in all these little micro habitats around our communities uh, like every person can contribute just by putting um, in, in, in the case of uh, monarch butterflies, um, just planting uh, what's called uh, milkweed. So there was a whole campaign across Canada through the, with the David Suzuki Foundation to get everybody to plant milkweed. Milkweed is, this, is, is a plant that's specifically the better, 
the, the caterpillar of the monarch butterfly is eating this plant and it's the only food source for that plant. So the idea is we, we need to create these habitats in our cities, wherever there is land available, all around our buildings, all around our homes, everywhere. And we can, we can restore nature even where we think, oh, we're, I'm in a city, I can't do anything. Well, you have a roof on your, bu your building. Maybe you have a flat, flat roof. Now put in a pollinator garden. It's not necessarily for you, although you might be able to go up there sometimes and enjoy it, but it's for the butterflies, it's for the bees, it's for the, it's for the insects. And that is actually uh, what's mentioned uh, before as well by this guest speaker we had a couple, a couple uh, weeks ago uh, from uh, the Sierra Club of Canada, who said the downfall of, of biodiversity and the biodiversity crisis we're in is really a crisis of insects. We are, lo we are losing our pollinators. We are losing our, our, this diversity, this vast diversity, uh, biodiversity crash that we're under, that's going on now is really about the things like, like the amphibians and the, which were the, some of the first to crash decades ago, um, along, with, along with the insects and along with the microorganisms in our soils. Uh, those are the things that we're losing. And so if we don't, uh, restore our soils and restore this kind of um, unseen biodiversity. It's not the megafauna, um, it's the microfauna. Great, thank you so much, Roy. I'm gonna let you move towards close if that's okay with you. Yes, no, this is good. Um, I'm seeing it's, we're now approaching uh, one o'clock here. So we've been on for about two hours. Thank you very much for that reminder, Andrew. Um, so thank you very much, Stuart, for coming on. We will follow up um, moving forward. As I noted, uh, we're also hoping to create here. Um, actually, I have a refugee network that I'm going to be creating along with an eco-village energy network, a museum network, um, a pastoralist network, and of course, uh, the school food program network. As we move forward, we um, hope to be able to uh, align all of what we are doing um, and whatever we do, uh, we partner with you, your organization. Uh, the outcome we want to achieve is to bring us one step closer to that dream of achieving a globalized, productive, compassionate, collaborative, regenerative economy that leaves no one behind uh, for all human beings and all our relations uh, globally on all uh, nations and all continents. Um, so this is that one and only beautiful planet we have, that speck of dust in the universe, uh, the only place of, uh, that we know there is life, this planet Earth. So uh, it's the only place that we will always be welcome and always call home. So if thank anybody you. Would like anybody would like Earth Day information and Earth and Sunday information, my contact information's in the chat. I'm certainly glad to, to stay in touch. Um, Lloyd and Andrew, thank you for um, welcoming me to this circle. And I wish everybody the best. You're very welcome, Stuart. All right, Lloyd, everyone, love you all. We're out. Thank you.